Muy buenas tardes. Sean bienvenidos al coloquio U.S. Foreign Policy Towards Latin America in the 21st Century, la política exterior de Estados Unidos hacia América Latina en el siglo XXI. Y como figura central de este coloquio, hemos invitado a una personalidad muy distinguida del mundo académico y de servicio público. Se trata de Richard Feinberg, quien se desempeñó en altas posiciones dentro del Departamento de Estado y el Consejo Nacional de Seguridad, organismo adscrito a la Casa Blanca. También es profesor de Economía Internacional de la Universidad de California en San Diego y asesor del Council on Foreign Relations. Su presencia es hoy fundamental para descifrar las claves de la política exterior de Estados Unidos en, hacia América Latina en este siglo. El Inter-American Institute for Democracy es un tanque de pensamiento eh, privado sin fines de lucro integrado por personas que creen que la libertad es la piedra angular del desarrollo humano. Son hombres y mujeres de diversas profesiones, antecedentes e inclinaciones ideológicas. Los une la defensa de la libertad en todas sus dimensiones y el respeto al orden democrático en todas las latitudes de nuestro continente. Cuenta con un fondo editorial dedicado a divulgar ideas y propuestas que definen la democracia y expanden la libertad. Hoy nos invoca en este segundo hoy, oh, perdón, hoy nos convoca en este segundo coloquio del, del año 2024 un tema de gran impacto para el futuro del continente, la política exterior de los Estados Unidos y América Latina en este vapuleado y vapuleante siglo XXI. Tenemos el proyecto de cubrir el siguiente programa. Habrá una introducción a cargo del embajador Mariano Causino. Luego participarán como orador principal, por supuesto tenemos a Richard Feinberg. Y participan Ricardo Israel, Iliana Labastida, Luis Fleischmann, Francisco Santos, Rodrigo Arboleda, Rodolfo Milani y Francisco Endara Las Daza y Carlos Sánchez Versaí. Los coloquios en el Inter-American Institute for Democracy se realizan bajo la conducción de un director. No ofrecen conclusiones. Y en el formato hay un, una exposición que plantea un tema hasta por 15 minutos. Y luego los participantes realizan preguntas o aportes en, en intervenciones de 3 minutos. Los aportes deben ser hechos sobre la base de lo expuesto por el coloquiante. Antes de darle el derecho de palabra al embajador Causino, eh, para que dé inicio a nuestro programa, voy a compartir con ustedes tres citas de tres presidentes de Estados Unidos que marcaron la política exterior de los Estados Unidos hacia América Latina en el siglo XX. Franklin Delano Roosevelt indicó, In the field of world policy, I would dedicate this nation to the policy of the good neighbor, the neighbor who resolutely respects himself and because he does so, respects the rights of others, the neighbor who respects obligation and respects the sanctity of his agreements and with a world of neighbors. Cierro la cita. John F. Kennedy, por su parte, dijo, abro cita, We propose to complete the revolution of the Americas to build a hemisphere where all men can hope for a suitable standard of living and all can live but their lives in dignity and freedom. Cierro la cita. George Bush Sr. dijo, abro la cita, in the Americas we are constructing a hopeful model of the new post-Cold War world in which We, of which we dream. This is the first hemisphere, and the OAS is the first regional organization in the world to take on through the Santiago Declaration the formal collective responsibility to, defense, to defend democracy. And in this hemisphere, the weapons of mass destruction, strategic missiles, and w uh, as well as nuclear, chemical, and bi biological weapons have been rejected voluntarily. And in this hemisphere, we have created new models of multilateral cooperation and success in resolving the conflicts that tormented Central America and carry weight in the economies of the region. Cierro comilla. Las tres citas reflejan un contenido de política exterior marcado por la, los principios de la colaboración, la protección de la libertad y la cooperación en materia de desarrollo. 
¿Serán estos los principios rectores de la diplomacia norteamericana en el siglo XXI? Voy entonces ahora a pedirle a nuestro, a nuestro miembro de la Junta Directiva y el, emba, el embajador Causino que por favor dirija las palabras de apertura. El embajador Causino es un distinguidísimo académico de, de Buenos Aires, es de nacionalidad argentina, fue egresado de la Universidad de Buenos Aires eh, y además ha sido embajador de su país en Israel y pronto será embajador en otro país porque está postulado, pero no podemos revelar ese secreto todavía. Bienvenido, embajador. Muchas gracias eh, a las autoridades del Inter-American Institute for Democracy eh, por permitirme presentar este seminario que una vez más reúne a personas eh, destacadas de las Américas para discutir eh, siempre temas eh, centrales para qué hacen al quehacer de nuestros países y nuestros pueblos. Por razones eh, geográficas, culturales e históricas, las relaciones entre los Estados Unidos y los países de las Américas han sido decisivas. Ustedes saben que esta, a lo largo de, del tiempo estas relaciones han sido amistosas, han sido controvertidas, han sido conflictivas o han sido eh, cuestionadas. Pero lo cierto es que este país, eh, la democracia más establecida del mundo, ha sido ejemplo para muchos de nuestros países eh, en, la, en la idea de eh, conformar repúblicas democráticas eh, respetuosas de la dignidad humana y en ese sentido siempre ha sido un faro de libertad para todos nosotros. Lamentablemente, cuando creíamos hace 30 años que la democracia estaba con, conseguida, conquistada, en eh, la enorme mayoría de nuestros países, y solamente quedaba un país bajo un gobierno dictatorial, que era Cuba, y parecía que Cuba iba a, a democratizarse pronto, ese, esas esperanzas fueron frustradas, y como ustedes saben, a lo largo de los últimos 30 años, sobre todo en los últimos 15 o 20 años, han reaparecido dictaduras eh, en, a partir del llamado socialismo del siglo XXI y al menos hoy hay por lo menos cuatro países en manos de dictaduras. Eh, por eso la política exterior norteamericana es tan importante eh, para analizar esta cuestión y eh, me es eh, muy grato eh, poder presentar este panel en el cual se va a tratar este tema tan decisivo para la historia de nuestros pueblos, para la historia de nuestros países, con oradores eh, muy destacados de las distintas naciones que componen nuestras Américas y a los que, los que nos une eh, bajo los auspicios de este instituto, siempre la idea de la defensa de la libertad, eh, la democracia, los derechos humanos y la dignidad del hombre. Muchas gracias y les dejo con los oradores. Le damos las gracias al embajador Causino y corresponde ahora el derecho de palabra a nuestro conferencista invitado, el doctor Richard Feinberg. El doctor Feinberg es profesor de Economía Política Internacional en la Escuela de Graduados de Relaciones Internacionales y Estudios del Pacífico de la Universidad de California en San Diego. Ha escrito extensamente sobre finanzas y comercio internacional y las relaciones entre Estados Unidos y América Latina. Y su último libro es Sumitry in the Americas. Ha sido ejecutor y creador de la política exterior de los Estados Unidos para el hemisferio a lo largo de cuatro décadas, abarcando servicios gubernamentales tanto en la Casa Blanca como el Departamento de Estado y el Departamento del Tesoro, así como en numerosos institutos de políticas públicas con sede en Washington. Bienvenido, en eh, doctor Feinberg. I think you have to start. He has to. Go, go. Uh, uh, it, it tells, tells me that uh, you're watching my, my video. video. No. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you so much. Really, it's a great honor to be with uh, the Institute and such a very distinguished group of panelists. Great honor. Uh, and Beatriz, let me congratulate you on your recent article on the resilience of Chilean democracy, which I thought was really quite brilliant. And I suggest if you haven't already to circulate it uh, to everyone listening to this uh, session. Uh, so let me begin with a confession. 
I am an optimist. I see a glass half full. And I reject the mainstream negative narrative of the hemisphere that emphasizes widespread democratic backsliding and debilitating economic stagnation. In judging progress, it depends on the metrics, right? And I always tell my students, set a low bar, set a low bar. You're more likely to achieve success and to reach happiness. Utopian goals uh, are too often the bane of Latin politics, and that's the path to frustration and disillusionment. I have 50 years perspective now on inter-American relations. I see some gray-haired panelists that have a similar perspective. And I would maintain that for most, if not all, Latin American families today, compared to 30, 50 years ago, living conditions have improved immeasurably in many countries, dramatically so. And, and as, as mentioned in, uh, already, in most places, in most places, pluralistic democracy is the only game in town. Most uh, younger folks uh, throughout the region have only lived under democratic governments. That is the only game that they uh, are aware of and see as possible and as probable. So let me say that the Institute, as an institute and as individuals, you have good reasons to celebrate these historic advances. Don't allow the naysayers to deprive you of your honors, your well-deserved honors. Okay, US leverage today is less than it was. Of course, we're in a more multilateral world. U.S. prestige was at its apogee after World War II and at the end of the Cold War, when it was needed most in the hemisphere, when the region was transitioning from closed authoritarian states to more liberal democratic uh, societies and more open economies. The U.S. was there in many countries at critical moments to assist definitively, successfully to assist local reformers. But now local institutions are stronger in most countries, they can stand tall largely on their own foundations. Okay, we are all terribly aware of important exceptions to these arcs of progress. We all know these cases. Some of you from your own personal, painful, traumatic experiences. We've seen that years, in some cases decades, of fierce economic sanctions imposed by the United States and in some cases by others, these intense, prolonged economic sanctions have not succeeded. Instead of driving transitions to democracy, what we find is stubborn authoritarian resilience. We find authoritarian regimes, despite minority popular support, can still maintain themselves in power. They can control state resources, they have loyal political organizations, they have a per per pervasive security apparatus armed with modern surveillance techniques. Political realism, therefore, requires us to recognize these adverse trends and to pose some new creative approaches beyond just more, more, and more economic sanctions, which have not produced the desired results. Now, economics, we didn't get the FTAA, okay, as initially suggested, as was pointed out uh, by Beatrice, by uh, uh, Bush Sr. But the region is interlaced with dozens of free trade agreements. And the United States has free trade agreements with uh, Mexico, Central America, and uh, uh, the Pacific coast of uh, South America. That's all positive developments. But we find throughout much of the region in economics, stronger policymaking, better educated policymakers, much more stable monetary policies in most, most countries, more flexible exchange rates, much more public policy transparency. We find both stronger states and stronger markets and vast improvements in social services as we uh, approach the UN Sustainable Development Goals in many countries, even as we have to recognize this recent setbacks from COVID-19. Now in trade policy, in both the United States, in the United States, both political parties, Democ Democrats and Republicans, now seem to be drifting towards a trade skepticism, tilting towards greater protectionism. Okay, so let's not talk anymore about trade liberalization. Let's not talk about FDI. Let's talk about global value chains. 
Let's talk about friendshoring. Let's talk about nearshoring. Because these are so evidently in the national interest of the United States. Nearshoring global value chains is the most creative, affirmative response to Chinese competition. And the U.S. has begun to move in that direction of, of incentivizing regional global supply chains, nearshoring, if you will. And that, to that extent, I recommend the recent article that appeared just yesterday in Foreign Affairs magazine by Shannon O'Neill on the opportunities for nearshoring in inter-American relations, potentially transformative. And in the area of international value chains, policies which were controversial just 10 years ago are now mainstream that global supply chains must honor internationally recognized labor standards, they must respect the environment and advance gender equity. All big advantage, all big advances in the trade and investment space. Now, it is often lamented that the US doesn't pay enough attention to the region. Well, as initially mentioned, by the way, uh, by Beatrice, gracias a Dios, in this region there's no threatening nuclear weapons, no vicious Hamas, no interstate wars that demand our attention. Yeah, sure, the U.S. could do better, could put more attention to the region, but responsibility for inter-American diplomacy must be shared. And more activist United States in the region would need more willing and able partners. But let's look around, frankly. Today, the Mexican president is proudly parochial. He never travels. Brazil, imagines it can solve conflicts in Central Europe and in the Middle East, turning its back on its own hemisphere where, he, where it formerly imagined that it could be a, a leader. And Argentina, bueno, quien sabe. In contrast to that situation in the Americas, if a US president flies to Europe and NATO, if a US president flies to Tokyo or Seoul or to ASEAN, he can anticipate warm welcomes and willing, eager allies. That's what we don't have in the inter-American system. And therefore, to argue that the US should spend more time and more effort and more capital, political capital on the region would require a uh, more affirmative response and more capabilities and willingness in the region itself. Okay, so what do we have in terms of inter-American relations? And this will be my last major point. In response to this fragmented, contentious hemisphere, the US has evolved what I would call a multi-tiered multilateralism. You have inclusive multilateralism, you have plurilateralism, and then you have traditional bilateralism. I described this, by the way, in a recent article uh, in the Wilson Quarterly. You have the universal institutions, the OAS and the IDB. Perhaps they don't have the clout that they had in their early and more formative years, but the US, the OAS was important in the recent defense of democracy in Guatemala. And how exciting was that? Compare that to all the travails of Guatemala in famously in 54 and in the early 90s, uh, 80s and 90s. So the OAS was very dramatic and a beautiful example there of multi -prong, multi pronged diplomacy and safeguarding democracy in Guatemala. The IDB is now under competent Brazilian leadership, it will help finance the important energy transition to cleaner energy. And then the third pillar of universal multilateralism, IDB, OAS, is summitry. Summitry engages the head of state. We're coming upon the 30th anniversary of the first summit of the Americas, you all remember in Miami in 1994. And uh, in 2025, we will have the 10th summit of the Americas. And the summits, some are good, some are uh, mediocre but they have given us some moments of high drama and they have made their contributions. When ideological fragmentation across nations makes inclusive cooperation, fully full multilateralism, not possible, the U US diplomats turn to plurilateralism, to sub-regional accords. Recent examples at the Latin, at the Los Angeles Summit of the Americas last year, uh, in 2022, we had agreements plurilateral agreements on migration, which if you read them actually are pretty substantive. Uh, and then we had the launching of the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, APEP, which is intended to promote nearshoring. 
We'll see if that can actually make real progress on the ground because we have within the administration, we much recognize the foot dragging of Catherine Tai at USTR, which represents the more protectionist wing of the Democratic Party and the Biden administration. And I would say she's made it difficult for APEP to really move forward. But it's, uh, it's out there and it's something that I keep urging my friends in Latin America to grab and run with. Now, that's plurilateralist. We still, of course, have bilateralist, and they are the great example of trilateralism with the USMCA. Uh, I live on the border here in San Diego, and the relationships with Mexico are complex, very multifaceted, uh, very intense on a daily basis, itself a topic for a, a long seminal. And then other issues that are handled mostly bilaterally, counter-narcotics, cybersecurity, mostly bilateral. So to summarize my talk, Beatriz, uh, I think I, did I stick to my 15 minutes? Uh, to summarize- Time, quickly, you still have time. What's that? You still have time. You have five more minutes. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do better than that, leave more time for my uh, fellow panelists, and then we can have more of a discussion. But to summarize, uh, inter-American relations rests on the foundations of liberal democracy, more open markets, both stronger states and stronger markets. Authoritarian resilience in some countries is real, and policy failures by the international community suggest the need for some fresh approaches. Meanwhile, inter-American relations have evolved a flexible menu of instruments, including inclusive multilateralism, plurilateralism, and our standard bilateral bilateralism. Going forward, the hemisphere has a very rich agenda. We have the restructuring of global trade and investment, uh, excuse me, of global value chains, uh, nearshoring, uh, tremendous, which could transform inter-American relations and really integrate it in a very meaningful and dynamic way uh, uh, across a number of important sectors. Immigration, uh, which I haven't really spent much time on. It's a very big polarizing issue. Uh, but, you know, after all is said and done, the U.S. continues to admit over a million immigrants a year uh, legally. And that's uh, so we despite all the negative press and uh, and some of the rhetoric from some quarters, the U.S. still remains a relatively uh, open society. And then the other big topic, of course, is climate change and clean, clean energy. And there, the hemisphere has huge advantages, natural resources, minerals, wind, and sunshine in abundance. So looking forward on the issues of global value chains, on uh, um, movements of peoples, and of uh, climate change, uh, the potential for really creative and deep uh, inter-American cooperation uh, is all very real. Uh, so, Beatrice, thank you very much for this opportunity. Looking forward to engage with the, with our distinguished panelists uh, in the remainder of the program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard. We are now going to open then this uh, conversation. And our first expert is Dr. Ricardo Israel, who is a member of our board at the IID. And he's also the chair of the, our, our publishing fund. Uh, and also of the Committee for Democracy. Dr. Israel is a lawyer. He, was, he graduated in the University of Chile. Uh, and he has a Master in Government Affairs and Public Policies um, and um, a, a doctorate in po Political Sciences from the University of Essex in, in England. Thank you. <clears throat> In relation to Dr. Feinberg's words, I want to say the following summarized in five, in five major points. First, the main characteristic of United States foreign policy to Latin America in this century is the lack of a state policy. Policies which change abruptly from one government to, a, to the other. And from the point of view of Latin America, the main consequence is the, geo the increasing geopolitical irrelevance of the region, to which there has been no reaction 
not even for security reasons, not even for China and Russia. Different to the 90s, there are no policies to be followed from one government to the other. This is not happening only in relation to Latin America, but almost in every important area, including Ukraine and Israel, but is strongly felt as a consequence in the region. Second, there is no major historical joint project, and the difference is clear and shown by a comparison of the first summit of the Americas, one very dear to Dr. Feinberg, which happened in Miami in 1994, to the last one in Los Angeles last year. Miami offered a path to a common market in economic development supported by two governments, Bush Sr. and Clinton's, and democracy as the political system. Third, both are to blame, not only USA, but also Latin America. To start with, Latin America rejected as a region the offer at the time of the 90s and at that time, the only dictatorship was Cuba. Today, there are four, and the number is increasing more than decreasing. Fourth, in the region, there has been a clear recoil in relation to democracy, as well as, and this is new, there has been a Latin, American, Latin Americanization of politics in the United States. Polarization, division, cultural war, and the almost impossibility to have any bipartisan policy in relation to the region. The problem is the United States is still the main superpower in the world. Fifth, China. This is a major change. The economic power of China makes it a very different challenge to the one of the Soviet Union last century. And Beijing is set to replace United States as the sole power of the world, and they also have a date for that. The century of the proclamation of the People's Republic by Mao Zedong. That is to say, October the 1st, 2049. We can be sure of the intentions because China is following what the United States did to England last century, step by step. What to do? I forward rapidly three ideas. Both Latin America and United States need to recover state policy as a base of their relationship. By the, from dictatorships in Latin, in Latin America, uh, the respect to the White House has been lost. And mostly in Latin America, there are no consequences for wrong behavior. Secondly, the second idea is needed to have an automatic response to the dictatorship mostly those where the government is in the hands of organized crime. Today, there is an automatic response to military takeover, which is more of a problem of last century, but the region is not prepared for this 20th century, 21st century type of dictatorship like Venezuela. And lastly, a new relationship probably will start by being fully aware of the historical opportunity that was lost in the 90s but also it cannot go forward if, if it's, as it's happened today in Washington, centered only in two subjects, illegal immigration and drugs. And thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Now we have the pleasure and the honor to welcome Ileana Labastida, who is one of the most respected journalists in, in South Florida. She's the director of Diario Las Americas, which is the dean of the Hispanic media in this country. And she's also a person who highly respected among the Hispanic communities here because of her defense of freedom and democracy throughout the region. Welcome, Liliana. Buenas tardes, gracias a Beatriz, gracias al Instituto Interamericano por la Democracia por la convocatoria de este foro. Eh, 
aprovechándonos del de uso de los dos idiomas en Miami, voy a hacer mi exposición en inglés, eh, perdón, en español, que es el, mi idioma madre y en, que, en el que me desempeño con más propiedad. Eh, la política exterior de Estados Unidos hacia Latinoamérica en el presente siglo es el tema que nos mueve a la reflexión hoy en este coloquio organizado por el Instituto Interamericano para la Democracia. En mi opinión, consiste en un tema siempre recurrente y necesario, pues si bien no soy de quienes intenta responsabilizar a Estados Unidos de todo cuanto ocurre, sí estoy convencida de que todo lo que decimos eh, o todo lo que se hace en la primera potencia del mundo, eh, eh, Latinoamérica lo toma como referencia no solo por el poderío militar, económico y científico de este país, sino porque simplemente eh, la mayoría de los países lo toman como espejo. De ahí la importancia no solo de las políticas hacia la región, también de las posiciones de Estados Unidos respecto a determinadas situaciones que acontecen en nuestros países. Con apenas mencionar ejemplos, podemos ilustrar el sustento de esta afirmación que hago. En el caso de Cuba, decisiones adoptadas por administraciones estadounidenses en el siglo XX aún repercuten en la actualidad de este continente. Comencemos por mencionar un suceso de la década del 60 del siglo pasado, la fallida invasión a Bahía de Cochinos que le ofreció a Fidel Castro el pretexto para proclamar la implantación de un Estado socialista a solo 90 millas de Estados Unidos con el respaldo de una potencia enemiga, la entonces Unión Soviética. Más adelante en la historia, la expansión de este sistema a otras naciones del continente y con ello la aparición de la tabla de salvación que permitiera al régimen de La Habana sobrevivir a la desaparición del socialismo como sistema en la década del 90, eh, lo alcanzó Cuba con la alianza establecida entre Castro y Chávez que dio paso a la llamada corriente del socialismo del siglo XXI. Y dando saltos en la historia, porque no es posible en minutos resumir acontecimientos de manera pormenorizada en paralelo al surgimiento de la existencia de la llamada corriente del siglo XXI en Venezuela, la nación que con su riqueza ha brindado sostén a la transnacional del crimen organizado, como lo hemos definido aquí en varios foros, desde la propia Venezuela también, desde Cuba y Nicaragua, otros enemigos eh, de los valores que representa y defiende Estados Unidos han expandido sus influencias, se han posesionado, se han aprovechado de las ventajas económicas y se han fortalecido. Hablamos de enemigos de Estados Unidos de tanto cuidado como China, Irán, Rusia, que en ciertos países de la región son vistos y tratados como aliados. Hagamos un alto para citar ejemplos concretos. La zona conocida como Arco Minero Venezolano, donde se concentran yacimientos de oro, diamante, coltán y otros eh, minerales estratégicos con los que se fabrican elementos para la industria electrónica, desde hace mucho tiempo, según se ha denunciado, la cúpula que controla ese país le ha concedido a China, Irán y Rusia la explotación de muchos de esos yacimientos mineros estratégicos. En Nicaragua, con el pretexto de fabricar un canal interoceánico, Ortega le cedió a China una importante franja de tierra, para lo cual desplazó y masacró poblaciones indígenas. En Cuba, a donde el canciller ruso Sergei Lavrov ha visitado en fecha reciente unas nueve veces, el régimen ha ofrecido a Rusia la base aérea de San Antonio de los Baños, ubicada en el occidente del país, y según revelara en fecha reciente un programa transmitido por un canal de YouTube donde eh, da informaciones eh, que recibe de manera confidencial de Cuba el influencer Juan Almeida, eh, con, información, con información suministrada desde Cuba, en la región central de la isla le cedieron también a Rusia el puerto de Casilda, que tiene una posición estratégica para acceder a, pa a países de Latinoamérica. Y entonces eh, la información emitida plantea que Cuba, o sea, la que fil se filtró desde Cuba, le está cediendo estos territorios estratégicos geográficamente a Rusia, en parte para saldar la deuda que tiene La Habana con Moscú. En una entrevista concedida esta semana a Diario Las Américas por el coronel retirado del ejército de Estados Unidos, Octavio Pérez, este oficial y analista político definía el papel que representan en el ajedrez político internacional a favor de los enemigos de Estados Unidos, regímenes como los de Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, tampoco descartó Brasil y México que sin ser regímenes o dictaduras les hacen el juego a estos gobiernos. Y decía, 
estos países son peones en ese ajedrez, algunos más eficientes y de mayor importancia que otros, pero sin dudas piezas de un juego a los que Estados Unidos no debe perder de vista porque en circunstancias determinadas, solo con enarbolar la bandera del antiimperialismo, les aparecen aliados. Buenas tardes. Bueno, agradecemos esta presentación a Iliana y ahora le vamos a dar el derecho de palabra al doctor Luis Freshman, que es miembro de la Junta Directiva del Inter-American Institute for Democracy y es profesor del Palm Beach State College, es doctor en Ciencias Políticas y es de origen uruguayo. Bienvenido, Luis. Uh, thank you so much, Beatrice. I, I really appreciate your um, introduction. Um, I actually heard the words of uh, Professor Feinberg, and he claims that uh, liberal democracy is still alive and kicking in the continent. The states are stronger than before, and the markets are also stronger than before. I uh, I have to disagree with all due respect with uh, Professor uh, Feinberg, but this is why I uh, see at this point. The Biden administration's foreign policy is currently focused on two main issues. First is the crisis on the southern border, and the second is the increasing influence of China in the region. And of course, you know, this is, uh, I understand the, you know, the policies that the United States is carrying out, like uh, improving the economic and social conditions of these countries, the encouragement of private sectors, American corporate investments, Uh, training uh, of locals to prevent child labor, uh, as, uh, vaccines for COVID-19, uh, food programs. All this, I think, is, is very good in terms of trying to counteract or counterbalance uh, the so-called uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the Biden administration initiated, and Dr. Feinberg mentioned it, the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, which is a U.S.-led forum to bolster regional investment. I uh, doubt that, uh, that the United States at this point is capable of competing with the Belt and Road Initiative in the region. I think the Chinese are well-established and well-rooted in the region, but I think that the effort by President Biden is, well, uh, is uh, worth the why. Now, <clears throat> With regard to the issue of the uh, the issue of democracy, okay, the U.S. has had a policy of democracy promotion for decades, and I think Dr. Feinberg actually has been one of the key witnesses of those policies since the era of Bush the first through Bill Clinton and others. Now, but I think that this policy requires reevaluation. As an example. In countries where democracy formally exists, it should continue uh, to support the consolidation of democracy and public accountability. The U.S. should make sure that leaders such as Javier Milei, who intends to fight corruption and reconstruct the Argentinian state, consolidates a democracy with proper division of powers, independence of judges, and transparency. The United States can definitely advise on this, has a lot to offer. In countries where democracy does not exist, the U.S. should continue to support transitions as much as, as much as it can, although I frankly do not expect Maduro to give up his rule over Venezuela. The administration has imposed new sanctions on Cuba and Nicaragua. Frankly, I don't know how much uh, these sanctions are going to work. In this sense, I agree with uh, Dr. Feinberg. <sighs> contention. Precisely, one of the biggest problems the region faces is the problem of multiple sovereignty. Governments do not have a monopoly over the means of violence because transnational crime and their accomplices have accumulated more power than the government. There is an anarchical situation 
that might well convert the region into another Afghanistan, a country, a region dominated by warlords and infiltrated by terrorist groups. The FARC dissidents, the ELN and Hezbollah already have a strong presence in the region and their presence is likely to increase. Not to speak about the influx of... Luis, China, Luis no te quedas. And their support for authoritarian regimes. Yes, uh, Beatriz, I'm sorry. 30 seconds. Okay, let me, I'm, I'm going to, to finish in a moment. So I believe, and this is probably one of my most important points, at this point we have a president in El Salvador that is cracking down on transnational crime. I think it's extremely important to crack down on transnational crime. I am aware that Bukele actually crossed the lines by uh, detaining people that shouldn't have been detained, by having long administrative detentions. But on the other hand, uh, he's providing an important service to the people that elected him. And now he was elected with 80, 85% of the population. Ecuador is facing the same problem, and more countries are going to face the same problem. So, and this is my light point. La, um, transnational crime is not an opposition party. It is a subversive group that eats the state like cancer. Fighting ca gangs is a war. It is like fighting terrorism. And fighting terrorism allows for administrative detention. Even democratic countries use these measures when they face terrorism. And this is where I think the United States can contribute. I think it should support the efforts to fight and defeat transnational crime. But at the same time, the United States has the capability to advise this country how to do, in within, how to do it within the framework of the law. That means everything should be legal. Administrative de de detentions should not be indefinite. House arrest, no military trials, right? Uh, with convictions based on secretive evidence, nothing like that. That means the United States can provide advice on how to fight transnational crime while maintaining the law. And I think Colombia, a plan Colombia, a plan that uh, Fe Dr. Feinberg is very familiar with, actually has succeeded in that. Da, Luis, uh, Luis estás re que te pasado. <laughs> Gracias. Ok, ahora le vamos a dar la bienvenida a un miembro de nuestra junta directiva, eh, Fran don Francisco Santos, que es periodista de profesión, vicepresidente de Colombia por ocho años consecutivos bajo la administración Uribe, infatigable luchador por la libertad y destacada pluma en publicaciones como Infobae, Semana y El Tiempo, y algo que muy pocos políticos pueden exhibir como credencial, ha sido víctima del crimen organizado transnacional que lo secuestró y casi pone fin a su vida. Bienvenido, Francisco. No te oímos. Prende audio. Está muteado. Ya. Muchas gracias. Y es que es Yo tuve el privilegio de ver dos momentos de la política exterior americana hacia América Latina de primera mano, como vicepresidente entre el 2002 y el 2010 en pleno Plan Colombia y como embajador entre el 2018 y el 2021 con la extinción del Plan Colombia. Y en el entretanto ver cómo era de exitosa la política de Estados Unidos en, de cierta manera, con problemas, etcétera, entre el 2002 y el 2010 y cómo fue de desastrosa a partir de entonces cediendo espacios y generando, digamos, distintas transformaciones que se dieron dentro de Estados Unidos y que afectaron la política exterior de Estados Unidos hacia Venezuela, por ejemplo. Entre el 2002 y el 2010 me tocó venir a Estados Unidos, me tocó ir a Estados Unidos, yo les diría que 50, 60 veces, a poner la cara. Yo era la persona responsable de derechos humanos. Plan Colombia. ¿Cómo se transformó el Plan Colombia en una lucha contra la criminalidad que luego se convirtió en un tema antisubversivo porque estaba mezclado, porque no se podían separar. ¿Cómo había una accountability permanente frente a, al Senado, frente a la Cámara? ¿Cómo con Patrick Leahy? ¿Cómo era una política binacional, o sea, y, y bipartidista? 
y cómo existía skin in the game, como decimos los, 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 como dicen los americanos, pues del plan Colombia solo representó el 10% del gasto que se hizo, Colombia puso el 90% de ese gasto entre el 2002 y el 2010. Se redujeron las hectáreas de coca dramáticamente, los, las organizaciones criminales quedaron totalmente diluidas, muchas en, en, en Venezuela eh, eh, viviendo y fortaleciéndose, eh, unas partes en Ecuador, aunque, aunque logramos eh, 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 hacer eh, varios operativos allá, pero era un tema de donde uno veía una política de Estado de Estados Unidos hacia un país que en el 2002 iba a ser un Estado fallido y en el 2010 era la estrella de la economía y de la seguridad en América Latina. A partir de entonces empiezo yo a ver cómo cambian las cosas. Cambia el gobierno, el presidente Santos cambia, eh, 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 empieza su gobierno y de pronto empieza a cambiar la política antidrogas y la transforma totalmente ante un silencio absoluto del gobierno. Desmontaron la política de las drogas, tanto que pasamos de tener 40.000 hectáreas, porque él la mantuvo los primeros dos años, y bajó de 70.000 a 40.000 hectáreas, si hubiera seguido hoy tendríamos un remanente muy pequeño, la desmontó e inmediatamente subió, subimos a 200.000 hectáreas de coca, con total complicidad del gobierno Obama, y no tengo que decirlo, en parte del gobierno, eh, del gobierno eh, Trump, que tenía otros problemas en esos momentos y no se fijó de esto. Segundo, hay un proceso de paz con las FARC, ya hay un plebiscito y en el plebiscito se dice no, y se viola ese plebiscito, que además es lo más importante, es una decisión democrática única, y frente a esto Estados Unidos guardó silencio, nunca dijo absolutamente nada, no quiso defender la administración Obama, la democracia y el peso del voto de un ciudadano y un voto en un tema tan decisivo como, es, como era este. Llego a Estados Unidos en el 2018, ya esos cambios, la política hacia Cuba había dado un viraje eh, y me encuentro con muchas cosas. Primero, la política hacia América Latina se maneja desde la Casa Blanca. El Departamento de Estado ya juega un papel mucho menor. Eh, eso se ha mantenido en la administración Biden se crean unas condiciones que creo que sirvieron muchísimo. Eh, en el tema de Venezuela se logra crear un gobierno paralelo reconocido por 60 países. Nunca eso había pasado. Nunca habíamos tenido semejante oportunidad de construir algo paralelo frente a una dictadura. Ya quisieran los iraníes en resistencia, ya quisieran todos los que tienen los mismos cubanos tener un gobierno paralelo dentro del país. Eh, las restricciones, es más, eh, eh, las sanciones sirvieron y tengo aquí que ser muy franco el deterioro te queda un minuto las sanciones fueron pero, pero frente a esto se cambia la administración encuentra uno un congreso que no tenía capacidad de tener una política común no se hablaban, lo mismo pasó con el gobierno el gobierno desechó este, este digamos este gobierno paralelo que se había logrado, empezó a negociar les devolvió a Alexa, abrió las abrió las, eh, eh, la, la, relajó dramáticamente las sanciones y la situación no mejoró, empeoró. Entonces, lo que yo veo es un país tremendamente dividido y una América Latina que se está narcotizando. México, Venezuela es un narcoestado, México, la mitad de México es un narcoestado. Lo que pasó en Ecuador no es, eh, no es eh, casualidad. Uno va allá a Argentina, a Brasil, a Perú y empieza a encontrar toda esa criminalidad mexicana involucrada con, con, con criminalidad latinoamericana y no ve una política de Estados Unidos seria frente a esto y si no hay una política seria frente a esto lo único que va a seguir pasando es que va a haber inmigración va a haber deslegitimación va a haber debilidad institucional y Estados Unidos va a tener un infierno del río grande para abajo, muchas gracias Muchísimas gracias a Francisco Santos por esas eh, reflexiones Ahora le vamos a dar el derecho de palabra al doctor Eduardo Gamarra. Eduardo Gamarra es profesor titular de Ciencias Políticas en el Departamento de Política y Relaciones Internacionales de la Universidad Internacional de la Florida, FIU. Ha estado en FIU desde 1986, donde también dirigió el Centro Latinoamericano y del Caribe, de 1994 al 2007. Es el director del Latino Public Opinion Forum. Bienvenido, Eduardo. Muchas gracias, gracias Beatriz, eh, y es un placer saludar a, a Richard. Eh, 
quien no veo hace, hace muchísimos años eh, y en, en gran medida pues eh, tuve, tuve el, el, el privilegio de, de, de participar con él en esa primera cumbre de las Américas. Eh, quiero, eh, voy, a, voy a pasar al inglés para, para poder responderle mejor a, a Richard y, y, y así eh, entrar en la, en la conversación con todos. Eh, in primer lugar, uh, let me let me say the following, uh, Richard. Uh, it's always, you know, that that old distinction between an optimist and a pessimist that uh, that often is uh, is alluded to, which is, you know, a, a, an optimist is a is a pes is a pessimist with information, right? And uh, uh, and I would love to say that 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 is uh, the case uh, in, in 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 with you. Uh, uh, given your extraordinary experience, your uh, extraordinary uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of influence that you've had over, over several administrations. That said, however, um, I have to, in some measure, uh, uh, contradict many of the things that you have, that you have said this afternoon, uh, even though I welcome this, uh, this optimism in a, in, an, in, a, in a hemisphere that is extraordinarily complex. Uh, but let me just say the following, and I'm going to focus specifically on the Biden administration. Just, you know, analyzing this administration involves understanding uh, a series of very complex and dyna dynamic factors that intertwine both with recent uh, history, geopolitical changes, and the internal challenges of the region. And so I would say that, you know, this administration in particular has been like all right it's been affected by the context that it that it inherited uh this post cold war or whatever you want to call it framework and and the current challenges of the region and so let me let me just simply say that uh, uh over the this historical framework if you will really has to deal with the following uh, and that is in the first place after the end of the cold war we experienced very significant uh, changes with very important transitions to democracy in several nations. But as several of my colleagues have already pointed out, right, uh, I, I strongly disagree with you, uh, Richard, that democracy, liberal democracy is fine. I think that liberal democracy is threatened uh, in the region by both the right and the left. This isn't an ideological discussion. This is uh, the trend, and it's an overwhelming trend away from liberal democracy in the context in which an administration is still about promoting democracy, not only in Latin America, but worldwide. And, uh, and in large measure, of course, I would even go as far as saying that liberal representative democracy is also fundamentally challenged, even in the United States and in other parts of the world. And so when we, when we look at this in a more global sense, Right, representative democracy uh, appears to be in in a very very um, um, ha I, I won't say dire dire straits, but but certainly uh, severely weakened, and and in the region. And let me let me be very very uh, brief here. Uh, there are five things that I that I'm going to address very quickly uh, that that I think in some measure challenge your optimism. One is as as my colleagues have said. Um, we have historically been about preventing the extra the presence of extra hemispheric actors. Yet today, it's probably true that uh, the presence of extra hemispheric actors is uh, is extraordinary, much more than than uh, than we we really understand the presence of Russia, the presence of China, and the presence of Iran in throughout the region. Um, secondly. Uh, as I was saying, the, the the fighting against the expansion of authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is a, a major, major current in the region. And, and here, Luis Fleischmann uh, um, praised uh, 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 for, uh, President Bukele. I'm, I'm not so sure that we ought to be praising uh, these this trade-off between between uh, uh, security and 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 uh, and rights. Uh, even though it, they may be effective, but it's not a question of effectiveness versus legitimacy. It's really something that the hemisphere has stood for over the over the past, at least since 1994, which is the promotion of liberal democracy. Third, the penetration of organized crime. I don't think we fully understand 
how deep organized crime, the penetration of organized crime has been. I don't think there's a single country in the region that is not undergoing some kind of challenge. Uh, and this linkage, especially between drug, drug trafficking and organized crime, that has e essentially led to a collection of failures, Ecuador being one, but one country that we have completely neglected and we've completely forgotten about that is the right here, now, 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 now away. Uh, un minuto. Okay, I'll finish. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and this leads to the 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 real issue in the region, uh, Richard, which is the the enormous presence of collapsing, uh, some might even call them failed states, right? And uh, and our inability now to 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 work with these so-called failed states, and uh, uh, and and Haiti again is is the is the extreme case, but there are others. I mean, uh, maybe maybe even even countries like like Venezuela and uh, uh, should be considered in that in that particular realm. And then finally, of course, the 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 thing that's affecting every single country in the region, and which the U.S. has been showing. Uh, dramatically uh, an inability to deal with the, with the challenges of, of mass immigration and the humanitarian crisis. It's not just the 8 million Venezuelans. It's, the, it's now the large-scale migration of Colombians, the large-scale migration of, of Ecuadorians, the presence of Chinese immigrants and others, all going through, through Latin America. And in every single instance, immigration has become that old word that that uh, that we used to use in international relations. This is now a an intermestic factor that ha that has become a huge challenge to democratic governance throughout the region. So let me end there. And uh, again, I really appreciate your optimism, but uh, I I think that uh, you know we may be looking at a, a very different continent. Muchísimas gracias a Eduardo. And I must say, Richard, that Eduardo was the most eager person to participate in this forum because he called me last night at 3.42 a.m. to confirm. So he really wanted to be here. Thank you, Eduardo. Now we're going to call on Rodrigo Arboleda, que es miembro de la Junta Directiva del Inter-American Institute for Democracy, arquitecto graduado en MIT, militante de la causa del acceso universal a la digitalización, jefe corporativo de empresas públicas con cobertura en América Latina, como es el caso de Ogden. Bienvenido, Rodrigo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Beatriz. I'm going to be very brief, because I think that many of the things that we were supposed to say or have been already said. My analysis, and I'm sorry to disagree respectfully with Dr. Richard Feinberg, is that um, we are now confronted with the U.S. in deep crisis, in my opinion, the present campaign for presidential uh, posts is a, is a very clear demonstration of that crisis. And uh, as a consequence also, we have the following countries that are not particularly interested in becoming such a good friend of the United States as, as we might think. Evidently, the, the usual subjects of Cuba, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Venezuela. Now we have Brazil and Mexico that are quasi uh, going against the, the U.S., not as front, not, not as in a front basis as the previous ones. We have Chile, we have Honduras, and we have Colombia. That is almost 80, 85 percent of the country, continent that are not a very a friendly uh, elements in the, to the United States or to the fight against organized crime. So uh, I'm very sorry to disagree in this respectful manner, and evidently um, we have a problem that is going to become more complicated as the months go by. This is my very short contribution because everything else has been said. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Thank you so much. Now we are going to call upon Rodolfo Milani, 
who is a member of the uh, of the board of the Inter-American Institute for Democracy. He graduated in the Thunderbird School of Global Management. He's a senior managing director at B. Raleigh really the Wealth Management, and he's the chair of the Miami Freedom Forum. Welcome, Rodolfo. Thank you, Beatriz. Buenas tardes. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a few topics that get me more upset than discussing U.S. policy in Latin America in this century. Our position towards the region can most charitably be explained as benign neglect. Our woke culture can simply not tolerate any policy towards the region which smacks of paternalism or colonialism. Historically, the U.S. has played a significant role in the affairs of countries south of its borders, often utilizing both diplomatic and military means to exert its influence. The Monroe Doctrine, a policy which was quite harsh about foreign involvements in the region, had been the guidepost for 200 years. Unfortunately, our State Department under John Kerry officially announced it dead in 2013. While the left tends to treat the Monroe Doctrine as a symbol of the imposition of U.S. hegemony, despite those divergent views, uh, I mean, the right regards it as a defense of U.S. strategic interests in the hemisphere. Despite those divergent views, the Monroe Doctrine deserves reviewed attention. Revisiting it should lead us to ask anew how to appropriately engage with our neighbors in Latin America, a task made even more imperative today by the troubling and often unnoticed activities of China, Russia, and Iran in the hemisphere we share. Chinese-funded projects in the region confront the weakness of Latin American institutions, their vulnerability to corruption, and the self-exclusion by some governments from more traditional sources of loans and investment all of which decrease the likelihood that the region will benefit from these projects. And politicians and businessmen hesitate to speak critically of Chinese behaviors out of fear that such talk will jeopardize the Chinese markets that they hope to access or the partnerships they hope to forge. The result is often that elites overestimate the probability of securing the hoped for benefits from Chinese. While underestimating the risks, in recent decades, however, we have witnessed a shift in approach towards a most more nuanced and cooperative uh, engagement with Latin American nations, which has led to the signing of trade agreements, joint security initiatives, and efforts to promote sustainable development across the region. However, it is important to acknowledge that ch challenges remain in the U.S.-Latin America relationship. Issues such as drug trafficking, political instability, and corruption continue to pose significant obstacles to progress and stability in the region. The U.S. must continue to work with its partners in Latin America to address these challenges through dialogue, cooperation, and shared responsibility. And should a Chinese invasion of Taiwan lead to war with the U.S., the commercial presence and military relationships China has built in the Western Hemisphere will likely be used to disrupt U.S. deployment and sustainment flows. China would, for example, shut the, down the Panama Canal and the Straits of Magellan, attack U.S. space assets from the Western Hemisphere, or project forces against the U.S. from dual-use ports and other facilities in the region. But Chinese influence in the Western Hemisphere is not the only concern. Threats posed by Iranian and Russian engagement are even more direct. Iran has worked through surrogate organizations such as Hezbollah to orchestrate terrorist operations. And just this past June, Iranian President Raisi traveled to Latin America, meeting and signing agreements with Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. Separately, Iran signed a defense cooperation agreement with Bolivia. Escalating tension with the U.S. and the Middle East only increases Iran's interest in expanding its reengagement with the region. Russia, like Iran, has periodically sought to challenge the United States through partnerships with anti-U.S. regimes. The threats the U.S. faces in Latin America are real and pressing. They involve regimes, China, Russia, Iran, that undermine our interests in other regions of the world. What then should our response be? In the spirit of the original Monroe Doctrine, dialogue with the region over the activities of China, Russia, and Iran must convey a sense of solidarity and shared interests not a U.S. imposition. In shaping the region's choices, the balance between U.S.-friendly democracies versus anti-U.S. populist regimes will become ever more important. 
The U.S. should also redouble its efforts to educate regional partners about the perils of Russian information operations, Iranian surrogate terrorist networks, and other threats. As the Monroe Doctrine turns 200, its continued success depends upon Latin America's choices rather than its obedience. If Latin America stands in solidarity with the U.S. against the new generation of extra-hemispheric threats, It'll be not because the U.S. demands it, but because the region recognizes that doing so is in its own self-interest. Today, approximately 18% of the U.S. population is Latino Americans, totally more than 50 million people, mostly of Mexican and Central American background. It is high time that our State Department starts to prioritize Latin America. Muchísimas gracias a Rodolfo Miliani. Ahora vamos a pedirle a Francisco Endara Daza, que es un colega del Inter-American Institute for Democracy de origen ecuatoriano, ingeniero en sistemas con un minor en relaciones internacionales de la Universidad de San Francisco de Quito. Es asesor de tecnología y analista político. Fue candidato a la Asamblea Nacional del Ecuador en el año 2012. Bienvenido, Francisco. Muchas gracias Beatriz, uh, muchas gracias, eh, quiero agradecer al, al directorio del Interamérica Institute for Democracy por la invitación y a, agradecer a quienes nos escuchan. Voy a tratar de ser breve, eh, simplemente quiero referirme eh, respecto a las relaciones de Estados Unidos y Ecuador, eh, comenzando con el tema de que estamos hablando de la política exterior de los Estados Unidos hacia Latinoamérica, pero voy a referirme al inicio de, a, respecto a Ecuador. Y quiero resaltar un poco que las relaciones diplomáticas entre Ecuador y Estados Unidos están entre las más antiguas del hemisferio. Los Estados Unidos envió su primer representante al Ecuador en el año 1825. Y en el año 1839 los Estados Unidos y el Ecuador firmaron un tratado de paz, amistad, navegación y comercio. Es decir, son casi 200 años en los que eh, esta relación ha perdurado entre Estados Unidos y Ecuador. Pero aquí quiero llamar un poco la atención eh, de quienes nos escuchan, incluso del profesor Feinberg, porque hay que preguntarse qué es lo que está pasando con la política exterior de los Estados Unidos, que toda Latinoamérica está en una especie de eh, conflicto, eh, tanto ideológico como político. ¿Y por qué, hago esta, eh, por qué resalto este punto? Porque hay que recordar un poco que en diciembre del año 2014 el presidente Obama anunció algo interesante que para el, sería un cambio para la política de exterior de los Estados Unidos, que era normalizar las relaciones de Estados Unidos con la dictadura de Cuba. Incluso cuando se proclamó esto, eh, no se hablaba, no se mencionaba de Castro como un dictador, sino que en los propios Estados Unidos se mencionaba al dictador Castro como presidente. En el mayo del año 2015, durante la presidencia de Obama, también se eliminó a Cuba de la lista de los países patrocinadores del terrorismo eh, en el mundo. En julio del 2015 se abre la embajada de Estados Unidos en La Habana eh, y Cuba abre una embajada en Washington, D.C. De ahí en adelante los Estados Unidos y Cuba firman una serie de memorandos de entendimiento, de diálogo, que no han demostrado más que los Estados Unidos se ha dejado engañar hábilmente por la dictadura más antigua del con continente, la dictadura cubana, mientras las violaciones a los derechos humanos en ese país subsisten, y no solo eso, Mientras los Estados Unidos le ha dado un respiro a la dictadura cubana, está aprovechado el tiempo para atacar a los países y democracias de Latinoamérica con el proyecto del socialismo del siglo XXI. Y por eso mencionaba el Ecuador, porque el Ecuador ha sido durante 10 años la víctima de estos ataques a la democracia en las manos del socialismo del siglo XXI, apoyado por la dictadura de Cuba, la dictadura de Venezuela, cuya imagen en el Ecuador es del partido eh, Alianza País, o de Rafael Correa, que incluso hicieron... Eh, dirigido por Rafael Correa y que hicieron un cambio de constitución y nos pusieron una constitución un poco al estilo eh, cubano. Y, ¿Y por qué resalto esto simplemente para ir finalizando? ¿Y por qué resalto estas relaciones de eh, exteriores de Estados Unidos que han cambiado? Porque parecería ser que los Estados Unidos han olvidado que Cuba ha sido y sigue siendo el principal atacante de... Eh, las democracias en Latinoamérica. Solo quiero recordar brevemente algunos aspectos nada más que en, el año, en abril del año 1959 ocurrió la primera incursión armada de Cuba en Panamá. 
Hubo otra incursión de Cuba, eh, armada de Cuba, en junio de 1959. En Perú ocurrió en 1965, en Bolivia en el año 67, en Venezuela ocurrió en el año 1963, en Chile en agosto de 1986, el régimen militar chileno descubrió el arsenal más grande que haya poseído cualquier grupo subversivo en América Latina. Los patrechos bélicos habían llegado transportados por embarcaciones pesqueras cubanas. Al respecto, quienes digan que estoy loco porque parece, para mucha gente parecería que Cuba es una pequeña isla que no hace nada, o bueno, la dictadura de la isla no hace nada, no dice nada, no ataca a nadie, son unos pobres inocentes palomas. Les recomiendo buscar el reportaje de la BBC en internet sobre las eh, intervenciones de Cuba. También les recomiendo eh, buscar o leer el libro Las guerras secretas de Fidel Castro de, de Juan Benemelis. Eso simplemente, eh, como resumen, solo quería decir que esperemos que en algún rato los Estados Unidos... Eh, desarrolle una política real, una política exterior con quienes han sido sus principales socios. Y no estoy diciendo porque considero que los Estados Unidos sea una especie de policía eh, eh, del mundo de Estados Unidos, porque eso es una tontería. Yo lo que considero es que Estados Unidos ha sido el principal socio comercial de Latinoamérica, como decía en un inicio, eh, ha sido el principal socio comercial de Ecuador. Y por esa razón, por las razones de que siempre han habido de hermandad de Estados Unidos con Latinoamérica, eh, deberían reverse eh, los, las, los tratados y retomarse más acción para apoyar la democracia. Uh, just to finish, I just like to address some words to uh, Professor um, Feinberg. Um, I just would like to say that, uh, yeah, it's true that we, we could see the, the glass, the half of glass, and, and say we are optimists. But I prefer to think that we, we could uh, yeah, the see the glass idea. in a more realistic way. Uh, mm -hmm. A glass where, where you have uh, mm -hmm. turmoil and you have uh, real problems facing and uh, attacking to the United States and Latin America. Thank you. Thank you. Vamos a pedir ahora a nuestro director ejecutivo, Carlos Sánchez Versaín, que tome el micrófono. Eh, el doctor Sánchez Versaín es abogado constitucionalista con maestría en ciencia política y una carrera pública que le llevó a ocupar las carteras de defensa, la presidencia y gobernación en su país de origen, Bolivia. Eh, gracias Beatriz. Un saludo al doctor Feinberg y a todos los participantes. A lo largo de la historia de las relaciones entre Estados Unidos y América Latina, hay una primera cuestión que es concluyente. Son eh, espacios complementarios, uno depende del otro y la relación entre los Estados Unidos y América Latina es imprescindible. Lo segundo es que eh, el poder, el tamaño, el desarrollo y la condición de potencia mundial después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial y de potencia unipolar después de la caída del Muro de Berlín y la desaparición de la Unión Soviética, cuestión que ahora está en discusión por parte de Estados Unidos, hace mucho más fuerte la influencia de Estados Unidos en América Latina y viceversa. Y en función de esa realidad objetiva, yo conozco dos clases de política exterior de los Estados Unidos. Una política exterior partidista que cambia de acuerdo al partido que toma el poder en la Casa Blanca y una política exterior de Estado. Y la época en que mejor le ha ido a Estados Unidos y América Latina es cuando Estados Unidos ha implementado política exterior de Estado. Y el mejor ejemplo de esa política exterior, el más reciente, es el que se da a partir de la Cumbre de las Américas de 1994 y que dura hasta inmediatamente después de los ataques terroristas del 11 de septiembre del año 2001, cuando el presidente Bush II empieza a cambiar y abandonar esa política exterior de Estado, abandonando la región y después viene el presidente Obama que la cambia en 180 grados y todo lo demás se conoce. La diferencia entre la política exterior de Estado de los Estados Unidos de 1994 al 2001, 2002, digamos 2004, es que en ese momento Estados Unidos y la América Latina estaban mejor, porque esa política exterior de Estado estaba fundada en democracia, desarrollo sostenible, lucha contra el narcotráfico, eh, libre mercado y una serie de principios que estructuraron 
aquello que se firmó el mismo 11 de septiembre del año 2001 en Lima, Perú, y que se llama Carta Democrática Interamericana, resultado de las cumbres de las Américas, y que es un tratado constitutivo con valor legal obligatorio y mandatorio para los países de América Latina, de todas las Américas, para Estados Unidos y para Canadá, en el que no deja discusión sobre lo que es la democracia en las Américas. La democracia en las Américas, de acuerdo a la Carta Democrática Interamericana, artículo primero, es un derecho de los pueblos y los estados y gobiernos tienen la obligación de promoverla y defenderla. Y en el artículo tercero da los elementos esenciales, respecto a la, liber a la libertad y a los derechos humanos, separación e independencia de poderes, acceso al poder y su ejercicio con sujeción al Estado de Derecho, celebración de elecciones libres y justas fundadas en sufragio universal como expresión de la soberanía popular y libre organización política. Entonces, la discusión es por qué en el siglo XXI hay un cambio en las políticas exteriores de los diferentes países y hay un cambio en el que las dirigencias políticas y las políticas exteriores de las Américas están tolerando a las dictaduras que son anómalas en el marco jurídico, legal e internacional que regula las Américas. La política exterior de los Estados Unidos, cuando es de tipo partidista, eh, refleja posiciones internas de diferentes presiones que se ejercen dentro del partido que toma el gobierno, pero los resultados son nefastos. Si comparamos la situación de Estados Unidos en materia migratoria del año 94 al año 2004, al año 2024, esta es una situación en la que hay una crisis que puede ser bien el resultado de ese cambio de política exterior. Si vemos el tema del narcotráfico, es mucho más grave. Pasamos de un éxito en la lucha contra el narcotráfico en la década de los 90 hasta el Plan Colombia 2004, digamos 2010, y después en una tolerancia a los narcoestados que se expanden porque hoy día Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia y Nicaragua son narcoestados declarados. Si vemos el tema en función de lo que es la seguridad de los Estados Unidos y la seguridad regional y la penetración de factores externos a lo que es el intercambio interamericano, Vemos un fracaso absoluto de lo que es la defensa de la democracia. Entonces, el tema que, en el que yo quiero incidir es que no importa cuál sea la política que Estados Unidos defina como política exterior para América Latina, pero debería ser una política de Estado que procure no cambiar cuando cambia el partido que controla la Casa Blanca, porque eso afecta totalmente, no solamente el destino de gobiernos y pueblos, sino de la región entera en el ámbito social, político y económico, como lo demuestran hoy día eh, la permanencia de la dictadura de Cuba con una crisis humanitaria, la crisis en Venezuela con otra crisis humanitaria, dictadura, la dictadura de Nicaragua, el narcoestado y dictadura de Bolivia y los cuatro gobiernos paradictatoriales absolutamente antinorteamericanos que tienen con Petro en Colombia, con López Obrador en México, con Lula en el Brasil y con Boric en Chile. Agradecemos estas reflexiones a nuestro director ejecutivo y le pedimos al profesor Feinberg que por favor reaccione a todos estos comentarios que ha habido a lo largo de la tarde de personas de diferentes eh, países que hemos tenido aquí, gente de Estados Unidos, de Bolivia, eh, de Colombia y también de Ecuador y de Cuba. Argentina, 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 Argentina. De Argentina que abrió. Y Venezuela, sí. tú eres de China. Sí. 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 Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Beatriz, and thank all the panelists for a you know, very interesting and passionate, uh, and sometimes speaking very much from personal experience, uh, commentaries, and then Eduardo, I appreciate your, your, your very thoughtful and, of course, well-informed comments as well. Uh, I'm glad to have some in controversy. Uh, I'm not here to defend U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but uh, you know, I do. I, I have for many years seen it up close. Uh, I have a sense of uh, what people are trying to accomplish, uh, the instruments they have at their disposal, and the difficulties and obstacles that uh, exist. Um, I think to blame somehow the uh, authoritarian resilience, I prefer John for what we see in uh, in Venezuela, um, Nicaragua. And uh, Cuba to somehow blame that 
on the White House, which has changed hands so many times over these many decades, I think is just a refusal to look inside those countries and to understand the nature of authoritarian resilience, which we see not only in the Western Hemisphere, uh, but in Asia and in, in uh, parts of Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Uh, these, uh, these, these fellows uh, know how to maintain themselves in power. Uh, and uh, let, let's not blame uh, international relations uh, for that. They have, they have instruments of control uh, which uh, are proving uh, they will not last forever, but they're they're very efficace, uh, at least in the medium run. Um, well, you know, uh, we all see the world through our own prisms. When I look, walk around Latin America, uh, I see uh, in Brazil elections at all levels, uh, municipal, federal, uh, and uh, provincial. Uh, I, I see the same thing in Argentina. I see the same thing in Uruguay. I see the same thing in Paraguay. I saw uh, uh, Argentina. You may or may not like the recent outcomes, but there were certainly plenty of choices for the people to choose. Uh, a, a beautiful and moving uh, display of, dem of democratic sentiment at the recent uh, funeral uh, ceremonies for uh, President Sebastián Piñera in Chile in which uh, all the major political forces, including, of course, Barak, uh, praised the former president. Uh, a real a beautiful display uh, of civic virtue. Uh, and then moving up, we may not like uh, the current government uh, of uh, Colombia or Ecuador, uh, but these were open elections that were contested and they were internationally observed. I'm sorry, you may not like the outcome, but this is what liberal democracy is about. And then moving up uh, to Central America, which of course is more mixed, uh, but uh, Costa Rica, Panama is going through some uh, tribulations. Uh, but at the end of the day, I suspect that democracy will continue. And by the way, in the Caribbean, yes, Haiti has for decades, I think since its origins, uh, has has been a very extremely troublesome failed state now, if you wish. But how about Caracas? Solid. Uh, how about the Dominican Republic? Uh, recently there, uh, which wasn't always, of course, a democracy, successfully transitioned to democracy. Uh, the governing party just won 80%, I think, or so of the seats uh, or the uh, in uh, local elections, and the, the current president uh, will probably be legitimately democratically reelected. Now, Mexico, of course, is a very complicated case, but I think now what are we seeing? We're seeing two well-educated, technically competent women uh, competing for the presidency. Uh, I didn't hear any mention of any of these uh, pr pr processes in uh, our in the laments of most of the commentators. So that's the world uh, that I see. Now, uh, in terms of U.S. policy, yes, uh, let's mention his name, Donald Trump. Is he a hiccup, or uh, is he a, a major discontinuity in American foreign policy? And we'll learn this on November fifth. Uh, of this year, uh, now, uh, you know, and that will that will will drive a lot of uh, changes potentially uh, in inter-American relations. It's certainly true worldwide that when a country like the United States uh, seems to uh, uh, move dramatically from uh, one uh, um, ideology to another, that creates uncertainty, unreliability. Is the United States a reliable ally? And um, those are questions being raised world, worldwide today in every foreign ministry. What do we do if the disruptor uh, returns to the White House? Uh, this is a huge problem for current foreign policymakers uh, who know that in the back of the minds, all the people they're meeting with are thinking, how much longer will uh, liberal democracy uh, remain in power in America? So uh, yes, a, a severe problem. Uh, another problem, uh, s several people referred to the overconcentration of decision-making uh, in the White House vis-a-vis -vis the State Department. <clears throat> There's been a long, a long-term trend. <clears throat> I think it's become uh, exact, exasperated, exaggerated. Uh, under Biden, I see uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, often acting as though he is the operational Secretary of State. I think that's inappropriate. Uh, the role of the NSC should be policy coordination 
and the presentation of options to the president rather than running around the world negotiating uh, the details of, of current uh, diplomatic spats. So yeah, I, I agree. I think this is a problem. Now, why has this occurred? Well, partly it's the result of, uh, of bureaucratic growth, et cetera. Uh, we see this worldwide, uh, executives becoming more influential. Um, but uh, partly it's because, uh, let's face it, the State Department, and I saw this myself in the White House, uh, a president wants results quickly and he wants some successes within a four to eight year time frame. State Department often doesn't feel that sense of urgency. And uh, therefore, when the, the uh, president doesn't get the uh, advice that he's seeking, he'll bring in his own people. And we've seen this under Democrats and Republicans over now decades. So uh, it's just, it's a long-term trend. Why doesn't the whole bureaucracy pay more attention to Latin America? So break it down. The State Department does, that. I mean, the Western, Bureau, Western Hemisphere Bureau does, but the Defense Department. Where are the Defense Department assets? In Latin America? No, a tiny little uh, uh, deployment in, uh, through, through Southcom. The real assets, of course, are Europe, NATO, and Asia. And that's, therefore, the bureaucracy, the huge bureaucracy, a trillion-dollar annual bureaucracy, the Department of Defense, is not thinking much about the Western Hemisphere. The intelligence community, I could say the same thing. And if you're looking at global trade flows, if you leave aside Mexico, then the action is heavily uh, Europe and, and the growth, the spectacular growth is in Asia. So the Department of Commerce, uh, USTR, uh, US Treasury, uh, where are they focusing mainly? And yes, it's not Latin America. So when the president calls the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and people state their concerns, they're focused, not entirely, but largely elsewhere. And that's that's it, guys. That is not going to change. That is not going to change. That's that's the weight uh, of of strategic uh, prominence uh, in in the world, and that's that's where it is. Uh, uh, now, the United States is particular. Particularly, we have problems, uh, as I made clear. I hope in my opening remarks that the major countries in the region. Uh, uh, by weight, by size, uh, by influence, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, uh, in recent years have not wanted to engage the United States in global diplomacy. AMLO, in particular, Mexico has a long history of mostly focusing on bilateral relations. Uh, Lula under Brazil is you know, marching around the world, playing global peacekeeper. Uh, not to say the relations are bad, but you know, you're not going to have a tight uh, alliance structure there. And Argentina has uh, talk about the United States going from one extreme to the next. Uh, we'll see what happens in Argentina. So again, it comes to partners. And uh, if when Tony Blinken wakes up in the morning and he says, you know, I've got these 10 uh, issues, uh, burning issues on my plate, and I look around the world and who's going to work with me? Who's going to help me manage, if not solve, these 10 issues? Uh, who do I have in Latin America? Well, uh, the big countries, I can't, I can't, I don't know if I call Lula or if I call Millet or if I call uh, AMLO, are they going to say, yeah, 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 let's let's work together on this, seriously. Or am I going to hear from Lula, well, we're pursuing this sort of non-alignment, and then I'm going to hear from Bolsonaro, uh, from uh, Millet, well, I'm, you know, I'm still busy getting my administration together, okay, fine, call you later. And AMLO, well, you know, I, I really don't have time for global diplomacy. So, uh, and I don't want to be seen to be too close to the United States. So those are the realities that a, the White House sees, that a president or the National Security Council sees in the hemisphere when every morning uh, Lincoln or Jake Sullivan get up and think about, okay, uh, where am I going to allocate my time, uh, my very limited time in the time of the president uh, on a worldwide basis? And then uh, how active should the U.S. be in the region? Most of you seem to be calling for a greater degree of American activism. Well, I also uh, like that myself personally. But, you know, as soon as the U.S. does something, there are other people who say interventionism, imperialism, strong-handed tactics. So in every case, you know, you sort of have to look for the balance uh, and decide, you know, what's, how do you best achieve your objectives, uh, without um, you know arousing too much of a, of a, of a counter counter reaction, uh, but this uh, the very strong pushback against too much of a U.S. presence, I think, is something we have to keep in mind. Why isn't there a Marshall Plan for the Americas? Why isn't there a European Union for the Americas? 
because it would be a non-starter, not only in the U.S., of course, but in most of Latin America. Uh, what does it take to get into the EU? You have to conform your national legislation to hundreds of EU uh, qualifications. Can you imagine any Latin American country agreeing to do that uh, with the United States? Uh, hard to imagine. So when we talk about there should be major uh, strategic initiatives that integrate the region, I think we have to just be aware of these very powerful underlying uh, historical historical currents. Uh, yes, there's pushback, as uh, Eduardo mentioned, uh, from both the right and the left in Latin America, sort of criticizing liberal democratic institutions. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you've documented many of those in your research. But uh, this is, uh, as you very well know, Eduardo, this is hardly new. And in fact, if anything, it seems to me, relatively speaking, and of course, it's, we're generalizing, of course, 35 countries here. But generally speaking, I think these attacks on liberal democracy are less cogent, less powerful, gaining less domestic support than might have been the case uh, in previous decades. But yes, of course, there are authoritarianism strong uh, in the Hispanic uh, tradition, if you will, uh, and uh, you know we we should we should certainly be be well aware of it. Then finally, a lot of you talked about the issue of crime and counter narcotics and narcotics, et cetera. Well, you know, the United States has had a counter narcotics policy since at least Nixon in the 1970s. Um, and uh, much of the Department of Justice continues to work on these issues. Uh, there's a pretty large counter narcotics budget sprinkled throughout the U.S. government. Uh, it's the central focus of Southcom. Uh, there's a large office, uh, IL, uh, INL, in the State Department that works these issues, and of course, intelligence as well. So it's not like the U.S. is like not aware or not trying or hasn't been working over many, many years uh, with governments uh, in the region. So, um, yeah, I mean, I personally have some qualms with some of the ways the U.S. goes about approaching it, but it's not as though the U.S. Is, isn't very aware and very concerned uh, about um, the the, the uh, organized transnational organized crime uh, in the region. So I hope I've been able to respond to some of your comments. Uh, as Beatrice mentioned, I will be uh, spending, uh, uh, I will have my new residency uh, in Florida spending most of the year there, uh, beginning shortly. And I very much look forward to more extensive conversations on all of these very cogent issues uh, with many of you uh, in the months and years ahead. And thank you, Beatrice, for facilitating this interchange. Thank you for to you for, for being part of this program. Uh, we await your, your instructions in order to give you a very warm welcome here in Florida, and particularly in the, in the, at the Institute. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you so much to the 1.3 million people that were watching this event through Infobae. Uh, thank you to Infobae uh, also. We are going to, to regroup with another important event on the state of the prisoners, uh, political prisoners in Latin America. Um, we, on March the 5th from 10.30 to 12.30. Please don't miss that event because it's going to be very important. Thank you.